behalf of the Neighborhoods Committee. This is a program we have planned for a while, and what you know, with the challenges of COVID that's been planned and canceled, and I'm so excited that we finally get to have this program. And I want to share with you, I don't know what kind of a walker you are. I discovered in walking with my friend that I'm the kind of person whose goal is to get from point A to point B as quickly as I can without going up steep hills. <laughs> and when I walk with Nancy, she's curious to know what we see along the way. And I discovered early on walking with her that I had never looked at things that I've walked by many times. Um, she's curious and she would say, what's the history of this building? Or did you notice the art that's right here? Or I wonder what role this played in the history of Seattle. Not me, I was just saying how many more blocks. <laughs> um, and then we, we looked at the work that um, Sus Susanna has done and she is of the same mold as Nancy. And I think when you leave tonight, you'll be in that mold too. You'll be saying to yourself, what have I missed? What haven't I noticed as I've walked around this neighborhood and in other parts of Seattle? I want to say also that because Nancy is curious, she's created for the Neighborhoods Committee Walks About Seattle. And you may know that they're available at HH, on HH Connect where the art walks are for the building. They're also in the Neighborhoods Committee um, um, folder. On, no, 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 on HH Connect. If you go to the Neighborhoods folder. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the front desk, they have copies too. But so if you walked up 9th Avenue from Freeway Park to Yesler Terrace Park, you would be amazed at all of the art and the history that is on that street. When you walk from here to the QFC, there are a number of buildings and parks to pay attention to. Or if you go for a walk on the Seattle View campus, there are both wonderful gardens to view and there's artwork to view. And Nancy has documented and written those up, so if you wanted to go for a walk from here for one hour, um, these, you could take these along um, and have somebody just say, slow down right here. This is where you want to see something. Um, and make you curious. So I'll tell you, I benefited both from being with Nancy and from following Susanna to learn that I could learn to be more curious and slow down and um, ask new questions. Um, I know that when you hear her tonight, she'll make you say, what have I missed? What do I now want to see? So Nancy's gonna do um, a further introduction of Susanna. And I want to thank Nancy for her persistence in making this program happen. Thank you. Well, I tell you, I wasn't going to give up. I am such a fan of Susanna and her work. Um, and so it's a real thrill that we're finally able to make this happen. Um, yeah, I, I, I became a fan as soon as I learned about Susanna's first book, Seattle Walk Report, which began when she realized that she could combine two loves, her love of walking and her love of drawing comics. And um, that book chronicled 23 different walks throughout the city of Seattle along with little pictures of the things that she saw along the way. Not just serious, you know, the age of this building, but where people left their used coffee cups, <laughs> or the shape of a fire hydrant, how different they were in different um, areas of the city. And I thought, okay, there's a gal after my own. <laughs> and um, and have, I fell in love with this book, but I was not the only one. This book became a bestseller and um, was a semi-finalist, I guess, for the Washington State Book Award. And it wasn't very long after that that, listen to this, 
Seattle Magazine named Susanna one of the most influential people in Washington State. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Susanna has a day job. She works for Seattle Public Library System, which perhaps made it inevitable that um, she would take a deeper dive into Seattle's history, which she does in her new book, Secret Seattle, subtitled, An Illustrated Guide to the City's Offbeat and Overlooked History. And she's going to talk about that tonight. And there'll be time for questions. And Susanna will also hang around a little bit afterwards. She has books available if you're inspired to buy one, or just um, chat informally with her before she returns, walks, until she walks home. So please join me welcoming Suzanne Ryan. What's a lovely introduction? Can everybody here be okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that. Yes. Thank you so much to everybody for coming out this evening, and thank you so much to Nancy for all the work that you did to make this happen, and everybody else involved. It really has been a long time coming, and so I'm really happy to be here this evening. Um, like Nancy said, my name is Susanna Ryan, and I am the author of two books. One of them is Seattle Walk Report, an illustrated walking tour through 23 Seattle neighborhoods, which came out in 2019, and Secret Seattle, an illustrated guide to the city's offbeat and overlooked history, which came out in 2021. It's not quite as well known, but some longtime fans may remember my first grade smash hit, the Adventure. <laughs> it's also sort of a meditation on walking in which two friends with a shared hairstyle journey into the woods, see a bear, and then decide to go home because it's getting late. <laughs> As a kid, I loved to draw. You could constantly find me doodling in the margins of my notebook or making cute Christmas cards for my grandma. It was all I wanted to do. When I was younger, my mom told me I was born with a pencil in my hand, and I thought she meant it literally for much, much too long. I think I was like 12 years old when I was like, wait a minute, how did that pencil? Anyway, as soon as I had some sort of awareness that adult people often have jobs, I wanted to be a ballerina who had a canvas on stage with her, and she held a brush in her hand while she danced, and then I would sell the painting in the lobby afterwards while everyone threw flowers at me. That was my big dream. But that dream, like so many others, was fleeting. And the last time I ever imagined myself having a job doing something creative, I loved to draw. And even at an early age, I recognized that I didn't want to turn something that I loved to do into something that I had to do to make money. So I figured, OK, I'm going to relegate this to those cute cards and just little passion projects for myself, and I'm going to find a real adult job someday. <laughs> As I entered my adulthood, though, my for fun artistic output dwindled to where art wasn't really something I spent as much of my free time doing anymore. I got a job at the Seattle Public Library and started making art occasionally for book displays and the summer reading program and other things like that. So it was kind of nice to have a job in a non-creative field, but have the opportunity to flex those creative muscles, but only if I wanted to. There was no pressure. Fast forward to 2017. I had been working my way on up at the library for seven years, still not making art outside of the occasional thing for work when on an otherwise completely unremarkable day off, I decided to take a walk. It sounds kind of wild to say that I had never just gone outside for no reason before, but I am pretty sure I had just never gone outside for no reason before. Any walking that had occurred in my life prior to that point was strictly out of necessity getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible so I could get back to my one true love, sitting on the couch with a soft blanket. 
there's nothing for me out there. And I have just never been the athletic type, walking included. But with a single step out the front door, it all clicked. Almost instantly, Seattle began revealing itself in ways that I had never taken the time to notice before, and everything seemed remarkable. In a Capitol Hill park that I had lived blocks away from for seven years but never even knew existed, I found a Tamagotchi, these little keychain toys that were popular in the mid-90s, hanging on a tree branch. An abandoned pile of goldfish crackers on the sidewalk was no longer just random litter. It was a tasty little sidewalk mystery waiting to be unraveled. I wondered endlessly about the people I passed on the streets, about the things I saw, about these tiny, nearly invisible stories playing out hundreds of times a day on hundreds of sidewalks across the city that would be so easy to miss if you weren't paying attention. It felt like just by being present and having an open mind, there was a secret world that had been right under my nose this entire time. After that day, my passion for walking and tolerance for blisters only grew. <laughs> what began as walks around Capitol Hill quickly expanded outwards to other neighborhoods, covering ground that would have seemed like an absolute nightmare to me only months before. I walked from Capitol Hill to Lake City, from Queen Anne to Beacon Hill, from wherever I was to wherever I happened to find myself hours later, and then on my next day off, I would do it again. What was happening to me? But as the miles and sights wrapped up, all my walks started blending together, and I feared that I was starting to forget the details of what had become an unexpectedly huge part of my life. Had I spotted that toaster hanging from a telephone wire in Wedgwood or Columbia City? I couldn't remember anymore. So as a way to remember my walks, I got the idea to create what I envisioned as an illustrated travel journal for my own city, figuring I'd record the route, the mileage, and whatever happened to be interesting on that walk, even if it was just a delicious crepe I ate or something like that. Um, starting an illustrated travel journal seemed like a really satisfying way to combine my newfound love of walking with my lifelong but pretty dormant at this point love of drawing. The stakes couldn't be lower. I didn't plan on sharing this walking art project with anyone. I thought I would buy a cute new notebook and keep it to myself, like most of my artistic pursuits. Or more realistically, I thought I would buy a cute new notebook and then quickly lose interest. But after taking a walk around the um, central district, or around uh, the U District and Capitol Hill, and taking notes on that walk, and then using those notes to make a little comic, I felt something gnawing at me. Something told me maybe I should put this out there and share it with other people. Maybe people won't care, maybe they will, but this is something I'm going to do anyway, so why not share it? So I uh, downloaded the app Instagram on my phone, and I, down, I registered the name Seattle Walk Report, because that seemed like the most straightforward explanation of what I was trying to do, and I put up that first installment. This was the very first Seattle Walk Report installment on Instagram documenting this five-mile walk. I lost the original drawing, so it's a little bit hard to read and not super exciting, so I'll just share this one highlight. I saw 21 dogs, which means I saw 3.1 dogs per mile. Pretty exciting stuff. Here's a later example from a 30-mile walk I took a few summers ago from Seattle to Bellevue the long way via Lake Forest Park, Kenmore, and Kirkland. On this particular walk, I heard on your left 35 times on the Burke Gimlet Trail. I got eight pebbles in my shoe, and I saw a snake in Kenmore. It was so exciting. I walked past this building on the left, and I thought it was just a cool building, so I took a picture of it, and then when I got home and did a little bit of research, I found out that it's actually the oldest existing building on the east side. So I drew a little ghost in the window, just in case it's haunted. You never know. <laughs> Under notable finds, we have Apple AirPod, left ear, just the zip of a Ziploc bag, a corn cob, and my inner strength. This was the longest walk that I've ever taken. The, uh, not all of my walks are quite like this, and my Fitbit step counter was quite proud and perhaps just a little concerned for me that day. I definitely didn't go into Seattle Walk Report with a clear vision of what I was doing, what I wanted it to be, or where I wanted it to go. 
it sounds kind of corny, but walking had truly shown me the joy in the journey and not the destination, and I took that same approach to the comic. What mattered most to me was that every stressful balloon, elephant-shaped watering can, or Washington Mutual deposit bag in a bush would be memorialized forever. <laughs> Somehow, someway, people did find out about the comic. I was actually on the light rail a few months after I started it, and I heard two people in front of me having a conversation about it, with one trying to explain to the other one what it was. And I kind of felt like a Nancy Drew or a Harry the Spy, like, this is so cool to just hear people out in the world talking about it. You know, I was walking along at two miles an hour, yet suddenly it felt like I was living life in the fast lane. On a random Wednesday in May 2018, about nine months after I started the project, an editor from the Seattle-based publisher Sasquatch Books reached out to me to talk about maybe making a book together. It was completely unexpected, but I was like, okay. <laughs> and six years, hundreds of comics, thousands of miles, and two books later, here I am. It all feels pretty magical, and all because I just randomly decided to leave my apartment building on a day off of work. And all without really understanding how to draw hands. What an inspiration. <laughs> For the book, conveniently titled Seattle Walk Report, I walked over 65 miles across 23 neighborhoods to gather new notes and material. I'll take you through some of the pages and show you a little bit about the process and how they came to be, which is similar to what I do for the Instagram comic. Here's a page from an eight-mile walk around Capitol Hill, which I will now read for you. Cranes seen from the top of the water tower in Volunteer Park. Seven. Baby ducks in pond. Eight. Oh yeah, I love baby ducks. Overheard on Broadway. They may try, but they'll never take my eyeballs. <laughs> Stickers on fire hydrants. I did a survey of 30 Capitol Hill fire hydrants and found that there was an average of seven street art stickers per hydrant, sticking it to the man. And then from Seattle's favorite newspaper, the Seattle Daily Crier, scandal in Seattle. A greyhound is spotted on the tennis court at Capitol Hill's Volunteer Park, right next to a sign that clearly states, no dogs allowed. Ooh. On the left, You'll see the page of notes that I took during my Capitol Hill walk, which was one of the first neighborhoods I walked for the book. I'm basically just capturing notes on as much as I can in the hopes that by the end of it, I have enough material to work with to try to find out how to fit things together and what may be grouped in an interesting way. It's kind of a mess while I'm in that stage, though. I tend not to do a lot of drawing when I'm actually out observing things, unless it's something that, um, like a cute dog, where I don't want to be like, hey, can I take a picture of your dog, and I just want to remember it really quickly. For the most part, I'm just taking a lot of notes, and then I'm also taking some photos on my phone. And then here's what the mess looks like when I'm then looking over my notes and trying to figure out what will go where and how I can group things together. And I'm also just writing little jokes or comments to myself to try to make myself laugh. <laughs> So here you'll see the progress of the page from the pencil version that I originally did to the final version that ended up in the book. Here is another page from the section of a walk through downtown featuring the Central Library. I'm really glad that the Central Library is so easy to draw because I didn't struggle with this page in the slightest. I wasn't there at 3 a.m. crying over my notebook trying to get this right. No, 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 not at all. I happened to walk by on a day where there were three people washing the windows. So I wrote that there were three people washing the windows and that the Seattle Public Library Central Library is made out of 9,994 pieces of exterior glass. I had originally thought about make, making 9,994 tallies on this page, but even I have my limits, I suppose. <laughs> So here is this very zoomed in photo I saw, of, or a picture of the window washers that I saw, and my page of notes, and then the first version of that page. And then here's from the original draft version to the final version that ended up in the book. This page from the book section on downtown is called The Wonderful World of Standpipes. And it says, once you start noticing the dizzying array of standpipe styles on buildings around Seattle, nothing in your life will ever be the same. <laughs> this is true. I highly recommend doing some standpipe spotting the next time you're out and about. First Hill is actually one of my favorite locations to do a little casual standpipe spotting, because there really is a lot of great stuff going on. You just won't believe your eyes. 
These are photos of the standpipes that I took during my walk. And it's really cute to think that when I took these photos, these were just regular old standpipes, and now images of them live on in a book forever. Just like, wow. <laughs> it must feel so good for those standpipes to finally get their due. This is from the section covering my walk through Soto and Georgetown called The Evolution of Georgetown City Hall. It reads, from 1904 until 1910, Georgetown was a separate city from Seattle. As such, city officials built a city hall in 1909 to house various city departments. Today, the building is a treasured landmark that still serves the community. I knew I wanted to include Georgetown City Hall in the book because it's always been a building that I've liked and found myself attracted to, but I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do it. So I did a little bit of digging and I found photos of the building in the Museum of History and Industries digital collection and the library's digital collection. So here's the rough draft of the first panel next to a photo reference from Mohai from 1909. And here's the second panel with another photo from Mohai, this one from 1925. Part of the building was actually a branch of the Seattle Public Library at that time, so I thought that that was interesting. And then I found this photo from 1966 in the Seattle Public Library's collection showing the upper clock tower portion completely removed. I didn't know what happened, so rather than find out, I just wrote, whoa, because sometimes I'm a little lazy. And then here's the final version showing, or the final panel showing the building today next to the photo that I took during my walk. Unfortunately for me and my laziness, my editor wrote, what happened? So I was like, dang it, she's on to me. I'm going to have to figure this out. So I did a little bit more rooting around, and I found this National Register of Historic Places nomination form from 1984 that was nominating Georgetown City Hall. And it said, by 1943, the remaining portion of the tower was threatened by vibration from the low-flying aircraft from the adjacent airfield. It was dismantled. So it was really interesting to learn that and be able to strengthen a page that I was already quite fond of. So now, rather than say, whoa, I actually give people a little bit of information. Very nice. Those pages are just a few examples of how I went about making the book. It was primarily a combination of note-taking, photos, a little bit of research, and just seeing what happened on that day where I decided to take a walk. Some other highlights from my walking adventures in that book include a real-life Ballard Beaver in Golden Gardens. I was so excited about that one. In the Central District, I found a Safeway basket with one clog inside. And then seven blocks later, I saw the other claw. <laughs> One claw would have been enough. What a time to be alive. <laughs> Two buildings I've never taken the time to appreciate before in Fremont. The Fremont Trolley Barn and the BF Day Elementary School. And then I found a dollar under a tree in Rainier Beach, and I wondered, is this a money tree? Unfortunately, when I went back, there were no dollars for me. And a dog using a human drinking fountain in the International District. <laughs> On that note, a uh, couple years ago, I gave a presentation about Seattle Walkerport to a bunch of first and second graders who were part of an art club over in West Seattle. And I was giving a little presentation. I showed them this slide, and one of them said, no, you did not. And, I was like, oh. and then all the other kids started chanting, liar, liar, liar. And I was like, oh. You haven't lived until a pack of first graders is chanting liar, liar at you. And I'm like, I know what I saw. I saw this dog using a human drinking fountain. But those first graders were certainly on to me. Anyway, while I was working on the book, I didn't have as much time as I did before to just take walks for fun. It was mostly all walks in service of the book, which was great. But I was really excited, once the book was done, to get back out and see what exciting new trash trends had emerged in my absence. But something started to change after my first book came out and I got back into walking. And I noticed that the things that were capturing my attention were the things that were a little bit more permanent. Like before I may have said, ooh, a banana peel on a lamppost. This is so exciting. I found myself thinking, I wonder about the lamppost under this banana peel. I realized that these little things on our streets that we pass by every day may have an interesting history all their own. And I had kind of kind of thought about that in the past with Georgetown City Hall and those other examples, but I wasn't ever thinking about making this a research-intensive sort of project. 
So I was basically making the comic like I normally did and then taking all these photos on my walks of all these other things. And I just didn't know quite what to do with it. I thought I'd maybe find out some more someday or maybe not. It seemed like a lot of work. But then I saw something that would change my life forever. I was walking with a friend on Capitol Hill a few months after the book had come out. While my friend was talking to me about something, I stopped dead in my tracks. There, on the side of the building at 14th and Pike, the old Seattle Artificial Limbs Company building, which I had walked by approximately 1,000 times before, there was this small rectangular door at ground level. In the middle of this door was a shield-shaped emblem embossed with the words, Clark's Coal Chute, patented July 24th, 1906, T.M. Clark, Seattle. To say it was love at first sight was an understatement. I wanted to start a life with this coal chute. While crouched down, I did a quick internet search for Clark's coal chute, expecting legions of Seattleites to be talking about this going back decades, with glitzy profiles in the Seattle Times of this absolute hero of a coal chute door. Instead, no results. Zero. Not one. In that moment, I knew what I had to do. I wanted to find out about this coal chute one way or another. Everything I had seen over the past few months and was mildly curious, those things I said that maybe I would research someday, they couldn't hold a candle to Clark's coal chute. So I went all in, digging through census records, patent applications, newspaper databases, and photo archives, determined to piece together what I could about this mysterious man and this beautiful coal chute door that he was brave enough to name after himself. A coal chute door that somehow, despite it all, despite the use of coal being basically dead in Washington for over a century, was still standing. A few weeks after seeing the coal chute door for the first time and knee deep in my research, I returned to 14th and, the, and Pike in the daytime to get a better photo of this object of my affection. Butterflies in my stomach, I'm all excited. I turn the corner and the coal chute door is gone replaced with a piece of plywood. A rented dumpster stood nearby. Had it all been some sort of fabulous dream? No, I know what I saw. That moment at 14th and Pike, it all became clear. Clark's coal chute may have been the one that got away, but what about all the other tiny details of our cityscape? and the stories behind them that risked being lost without anyone ever having noticed that they were there to begin with. Once I looked at the photos I had taken over the last few months and thought about what I knew and what I would like to know about this living history, and I had the outline to make a book. I got the green light to make the book, Secret Seattle, in March 2020 a completely unremarkable month that you probably don't remember because nothing really happened or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But with my normal bustling social calendar suddenly empty, those early pandemic days were a great opportunity to do the kind of research deep dives that this book would require, like spending six hours digging through turn-of-the-century trade publications with names like Sanitary and Heating Age, and skimming 100-year-old municipal construction manuals. With libraries and archives closed, I had to rely almost entirely on online resources for my research. And I had to get pretty creative with finding information. I really didn't know when I started to do my research whether I'd be able to find anything at all about the things I was interested in. But much to my surprise, I could for nearly everything, except for traffic control boxes. There's nothing interesting to say about traffic control boxes. I tried so hard. Although if you know anything, please do let me know. <laughs> Here are some of the stories I dug up for Secret Seattle, all from the comfort of my pandemic couch. No one asked, but if I had to pick my top celebrity of Seattle sidewalks, I'd say it's downtown in Pioneer Square's ornamental street lights, called cluster lights. If you've been downtown at any point in the last hundred years, you may not have known it, but you are living among legends. With their white globe light lights in groups of three or five and thoughtfully designed bases, this style of street light has been lining Seattle's busiest thoroughfares for over a century. The idea for the city's cluster lights dates back to the 1900s when Seattle had a mission 
to become the best lighted city in America ahead of the 1909 Alaskan Yukon Pacific Exposition, Seattle's first World's Fair. Buzz over a plan to install streetlights began in 1906, but it wouldn't be until January 1909 that Third Avenue's 117 cluster lights were first illuminated. The city went wild. The demand for more was immediate. Within weeks, petitions and permits were flying from business owners across the city, eager to see these lights on their own blocks. And the lights actually also became a selling point for downtown living. Everybody is trying to get onto 3rd Avenue now to enjoy the cluster lights. Don't blame them, read an apartment block ad from February 1909 in the Seattle Times. Soon, the cluster lights spread to 1st and 2nd Avenues, and Seattle's best lighted ambitions were realized. Directory publisher R.L. Polk, visiting in uh, June 1909 to get an early look at preparations for the expo, called Seattle one of the handsomest cities in the entire country and said that the cluster lights give the whole section an appearance of splendor difficult to describe. After visiting in September 1909, the mayor of Atlanta agreed, saying, Seattle has a lot of things we want down in Atlanta, and cluster lights is one. The lights continued to be the talk of the town in the years that followed. The Times wrote in 1912 that the attractive street lights of the metropolis of the Pacific Northwest have been a source of wonder and admiration of visitors ever since the cluster system was installed. At a meeting to discuss the merits of various types of street lighting that same year, an electrical engineer remarked, I think Seattle has the finest example of street illumination from posts and cluster lights that there is in this country. I will go further and say the cluster lamps in Portland are not one third as good. Oh, Portland, you call that a cluster light? I would be so embarrassed. <laughs> While there have been refurbishments and replacements along the way, and the ones that you walk past today may not be the original ones that were there, it's just kind of sweet to me to think about this little aesthetic continuity in our streetscapes and to think about all the people across the years that have walked by these. I just think it's really cool. I recently came across a photo of myself on a third grade field trip to Pioneer Square. Fun. And in the background, it's really hard to see, but there's a tiny little cluster light in the background. And I thought, wow, you're going to write the book on cluster lights one day. Aren't you excited? <laughs> in the 1911 Seattle City Light Annual Report, which I read all of, so you don't have to, it made me a little proud to see that under facts worth knowing about Seattle, Right under, Seattle has no blizzards, cyclones, cloudbursts, droughts, or poisonous insects or reptiles. They could claim with certainty, Seattle is the best lighted city in America. Oh. Another story that I'm happy to have shed light on is the secret world of Seattle's sidewalk stamps. In the early 1900s, Seattle was ready to upgrade their wooden plank walkways to the latest and greatest in sidewalk technology, concrete. At that time in many cities, it was a common practice for the contractors selected for the job to stamp their name into the sidewalk as a form of advertisement and to celebrate a sidewalk well paved. Across the city today, you can still find these sidewalk stamps denoting a sidewalk that is likely over 100 years old. One of the most common sidewalk stamps I've seen in Seattle is from the Sparger Concrete Company, founded by Robert L. Sparger. I feel fairly confident that his uh, construction company paved more of Seattle sidewalks during this great Seattle pave wave of the early 1900s than any other contractor. Sparger was very enthusiastic about concrete. He just loved the stuff. He ended up building the entire first floor of his Queen Anne home with concrete, floors, walls, and all. A little concerning, but we all have our passions, right? And he actually wrote later on that year to um, the uh, city to ask if he could use cement to connect houses with sewer lines and received a response that said most emphatically no, all caps. And then in 1929, in the sensitive words of the Seattle Post Intelligence or newspaper, Sparger dropped dead at the age of 65. But his sidewalks live on today. Unlike the very prolific Sparger Concrete Company, my second notable sidewalk stamp I've actually only seen one of, near West Lee Street and an alley near 7th Avenue West on Queen Anne, but there may be more. It's the mark of John Granger Pierce. 
He's sort of the bad boy of the Seattle sidewalk stamp scene. John Pierce moved to Seattle in 1900, eager to live his life in Sioux City, Iowa behind. His, and with good reason, his dad, a real estate developer, also named John Pierce, needed a fresh start after staging a fake mansion raffle where he had promised to give his entire 21-room mansion to one lucky winner. After selling over 40,000 tickets nationwide at a dollar apiece, it was revealed that the whole thing had been fixed to favor some New York millionaire that Papa Pierce owed money to. Can't we just get an honest mansion raffle around here for once? So the whole Pierce family just up and left, making their way to Seattle. The younger Pierce got a job as a contractor and then eventually got appointed to the Seattle City Council in 1911 after a council member had to resign due to illness. When a seat was up for election the following year, Pierce decided to run and he won only to resign two years later when it was revealed that he had illegally sought contributions for the campaign of someone running for mayor and lived the rest of his life outside of the city's limelight. But I guess he must have been doing something right with his sidewalks because at least one of them is still here. A little concrete reminder to disgraced former city council members everywhere. I started noticing names imprinted in some sidewalks around town pretty much as soon as I got into walking, but I never took much time to stop and think about it or just give them much thought at all. But then in December 2019, I was taking a walk around Montlake and I met this very nice cat. And as I was petting the cat and kind of telling the cat about my day, the cat just kind of waltzed on over to a sidewalk stamp. And I became interested in a way that I hadn't been before. I told myself that every time I saw one of these, I would start taking pictures to start to see if I noticed any patterns or just different things emerging. A lot of them were too faded to read, but then sometimes you'd find one that was faded in the opposite direction a few blocks later so you could kind of figure out, okay, I know what this stamp says now. So it's kind of fun. My all-time favorite sidewalk stamp, I actually didn't include, or I didn't see in time to include in Secret Seattle, so this is kind of a sidewalk stamp exclusive. Um, it's the name J. Calbert, which I spotted on 20th and Mercer shortly after the book had come out. When I began to research the name, I found out that John Calbert was maybe not the best contractor in Seattle. I hate to say it. In 1903, he won a contract to grade and add sidewalks to a number of streets around Denny Way and 3rd Avenue in Belltown, which at the time was a working class neighborhood, popular with the people who worked nearby on the waters of Puget Sound. In preparation for the new walkways, the streets were torn up, the existing wooden plank sidewalks were removed, and then Calbert and his crew did absolutely nothing for 15 months. The Seattle PI wrote in December 1904 that the thoroughfares have been seas of mud and water where the people who live in the street can hardly get in and out of their houses. They don't do it with wading through mud almost up to their knees for 15 months. It's amazing to think about. <laughs> Eventually, Calvert was called before the city to explain himself. That very same day he went before the council, 15 months after he had signed the contract for the Belltown sidewalks, Calvert became very active, in the words of the PI, and placed a full force of men at work laying the sidewalks in double quick time. He is incidentally demonstrating the council claim that the sidewalks could have been laid a long time ago if the men had been put there to do the work. <laughs> Classic. Before noticing sidewalk stamps, I never really considered that some of our sidewalks could be the original, but it makes total sense. If it's not broken, why would the city spend money to fix it? Like the cluster lights, it's cool to think about these little continuities in our neighborhoods and all the Seattleites who have made their way across these same sidewalks over the years. But what about the coal chute door turned piece of plywood that started it all? It's now a window, by the way, so boring. Well, as I was walking away to gather my thoughts, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, another Clark's coal chute appeared before me, and another. Peppered across this neighborhood's buildings were these little remnants from the past. Rusty ones, ones in pairs, ones good for taking selfies with. It was incredible and only solidified my commitment to telling the Clark's coal chute story one way or another. Clark 
Alex Colchip, creator Theodore Clark, was himself a longtime Capitol Hill resident. Born in New York in April 1947, we're both Tauruses, Clark, a sheet metal worker, moved to Seattle in the 1880s and set up shop manufacturing portable camp stoves that would go on to be popular with the flocks of men flocking to uh, Alaska with the dreams of striking it rich in the gold rush. He patented what would later become Clark's coal chute in 1906. Before natural gas or electric heat, many people used coal to heat their homes or businesses, and coal chutes were a convenient way for coal merchants to deliver this much needed resource. Typically, the chutes would lead to a coal bin or special room in the basement. In his patent application, Clark writes enthusiastically about the latest and greatest in coal chute door technology. This one has certain new and useful improvements and a neat and attractive appearance. I think we can all agree on that last point, yowza. Clark designed his coal chute to be burglar proof, so would-be intruders couldn't slide into your home and steal your stuff, a surprisingly common problem of the coal chute era. The coal chute appeared to be a hit, and within five years, Clark had sold over 1,400 coal chutes in Washington and Oregon. Time marches on, though, and by 1920, Clark had given up his business, likely due to old age. He died on December 4, 1921. It is unknown how many of Clark's coal chutes were eventually installed or how many still exist, but on 18th and Thomas, only two blocks away from Clark's longtime home, there's a Clark's coal chute on the side of an apartment building. Aww. Wouldn't it be weird if your name was two blocks away from where you live now 100 years from now? I don't know about that. So that's basically the gist of Secret Seattle. My walks and my life have been enriched tremendously since learning these stories about these little details in our cityscape. It feels like I can kind of go on an interesting vacation or museum trip whenever I go outside just because I know where to look. Um, if you've ever been curious about something in your neighborhood or wanting to, wanted to research local history, there are a ton of great resources out there to help you get started. I'm just going to focus on my favorite one, which is available um, for free if you have a Seattle Public Library card. Um, it's digital newspapers. Fully digitized editions of the Seattle Times and the Seattle PI newspapers are available for free with your Seattle Public Library card. To access them, you go to the library's website, which is spl.org. You click online resources at the top. There's a quick link that says magazines and newspapers, and then on that page, you just scroll and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll until you get to the Seattle PI or the Seattle Times. From there, you log in with your library card number and PIN number, and then you're in. I'm telling you this because I really want everyone to do it. <laughs> it's so much fun. While you can casually browse old issues or find out what the headlines were on the day you were born, what I typically do is search for a particular term, a name, a place, an address, or a thing. Then I'll sort the results from oldest to newest. Or if I have a particular time frame I'm interested in, I will narrow down the search to just that time frame. But one of the nice things about this is that it makes it fairly easy to figure out how to use it. A lot of times these websites kind of, everything seems kind of scary and varied, but this one's pretty straightforward and this is one of the things that I really appreciate it. Research side, this is also some cheap entertainment. One night I searched for fine felines in the Times to see if ever in 127 years the Seattle Times had ever said fine felines. And to my surprise, they did. Exactly once on November 7th, 1913 with this. High praise from Eastern cat expert. Mrs. Elizabeth L. Brace of New York says Pacific Northwest has as fine felines as anywhere else. <laughs> Extols efforts of Secretary Rasdale. Rhododendron Duke, owned in Seattle, declared to be the finest blue-eyed white male in country. Rhododendron Duke is a cat, by the way. And the best cat name I have ever heard. The next thing I know, I'm reading sentences in this article like cat shows or something like baby shows. And then a few related searches later, and I was learning all about the inner workings of the Queen Anne Cat Club, and how they used to host their cat shows on the fourth floor of the former Bon Marche building downtown. And now I'm imagining these turn of the century cats battling at curtain tassels on the fourth floor of the Bon Marche building, and I'm like, wow, all of this excitement simply because I decided to search for fine felines in the newspaper database on a fun Friday night. 
tells you a little bit about myself. <laughs> there's also a great, uh, through the Library of Congress, there's this website called Chronicling America, and they have a bunch of different Washington State newspapers, and actually uh, newspapers from all across America. They have the old Seattle Star newspaper, they have the Seattle Republican, a few other very old ones. So those are fun to search as well. I don't find the, it quite as intuitive to search, so I recommend if you're interested, starting with the Seattle Times and PI, but it's just great to know some of those resources that are out there. And like I said earlier, I was amazed that I was able to do all the research for my book use, utilizing the wealth of information that was available online. I feel like a lot of research type stuff can feel a little bit intimidating, like where do you even start? But I encourage you if you have any interest in this stuff, just to try it out. Maybe something low stakes, maybe just look at the issue from the day you were born, or you know, you can look up an X and see any time that their name ever appeared in the Seattle Times, you know? Um, so that's basically me, and that's Seattle Walk Report and my whole journey. I really feel grateful every day that I have the opportunity to connect with people like this, and I've been able to make these books and share my passions with people. It's amazing to think that when I left my apartment on some weird whim in 2017, and then later when I decided to share Seattle Walk Report, I couldn't have imagined that I was setting out on a journey that would lead me here. And I really appreciate you all being here tonight. And again, thank you to Nancy for getting this all organized. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have or comments, concerns. I'm all ears. Thank you. their neighborhood organization pay somebody to paint traffic signal boxes and here on First Hill, the First Hill um, Improvement Association paid somebody whose name I've forgotten to paint um, pictures of landmarks, First Hill landmarks like the Sorrento Hotel and the Stimson Green Mansion and one of the self-guided walks that Jenny referred to early on takes you by some of these traffic signal boxes. So that's all plug for for the self-guided walks. So we have we have some back runners if there's questions, and um, and um, if, if, as soon as we're done. Um, Susanna will be over here and you can chat with her and possibly buy one of her books. Um, so, someone just, someone that once told me that the manhole covers were very interesting and varied in Seattle. Could you comment on that? Yes, yeah, Seattle has, it's one of those things where once you start noticing all the different manhole covers, you're in for a treat. There really are a huge variety of them. And there was also, I can't remember exactly when it took place, but there's been a few different initiatives over the years where the city partners with artists to have them design special manhole covers. There's quite a few of them downtown. There's some with a cool fish design, and there's one that kind of has a map of the city and has the old kingdom on there, you know, so, um, but there's some really cool ones. But, you know, I really love, a lot of the manhole covers that you see are very old. Um, I was walking along Madison while they've been doing all the construction that they've been doing over there, and it's interesting how even when they're tearing an entire road apart, they keep those manhole covers. Because I think it's just cheaper than having to tear them all out. And so a lot of the ones that you see have been around pretty much as long as there's been a manhole cover there. If it's not broke, they don't fix it. <laughs> oh, 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 another plug for the self-guided walks. They're on the way to the QFC, there's a artist designed manhole cover in that walk, the, the walk to the QFC. So. Looks like Nancy's got all the hot spots. <laughs> There's also um, something called a coal hole, which is similar to a coal chute, except it looks more like a manhole cover. And there's this one in Ballard outside of the St. Alphonsus Church, 
Um, and it has the letter C-O-A-L in this really cool scripty design. I love it. It's really cool. Have you ever looked to see what's on the other side of the coal chute doors? <laughs> you know, the, there's the one on 18th and Thomas, which is the one for, uh, uh, that's two blocks away from where the coal chute creator lived. Most of them are painted over and you can't really open them, but this one, very slightly in the corner, you can kind of peek in there. And so I've gone with a flashlight. I'm sure the people who live in that building are like, what are you doing? Um, but I've looked in there, but I haven't been able to fully, um, you know, open that door or slide in and you know, do any of that stuff. I would like to have one someday. I wish I had um, gone in that dumpster the day that I saw it being torn out, um, because it would be such a great conversation piece, you know, for my home. Like, oh, this is my cold shoe door, but one of these days. Question, do they still put stems on concrete? Typically not. I think because it's more often done by the city now than all these different contractors, um, that they just have a different way of doing it. And there are just so many, I guess, other ways that people can advertise. But it is fun and cool to see. I mean, I could write another book just about it. I feel like I barely scratched the surface of what I was able to fit in the book. but. It's interesting. It seems like any time I just decide to randomly start researching some different um, sidewalk stamp I've seen, there's some interesting history or some dramatic story about them missing their deadlines and you know leaving people to wade in water up to their knees. So um, I wish that I wish there was more fun stuff or little things like that today that people did, or even just putting the date in the sidewalk so you can know all oh, this. Sidewalk was paved in 2022, and this one was paved in 1972, or whatever, just to have those little historical connections that people can see a little bit more readily. But I'm not the mayor, not yet. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh, oh, oh. okay. I've noticed on some of our sidewalks we have foot footprints of dancers. Uh, when was that started? I believe that those, so you're mentioning there's along Broadway mostly, there are these golden um, footprints that have different little dance steps on them. And I believe they're from the early 90s. I know that in the late 80s and early 90s, um, a lot of the sidewalks on Broadway were redone, and the tiling that you see, if you can kind of visualize that, there's some, I think they're maybe blue and red tiling, um, that was done during that time. So sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, I think for those. It's really interesting to see all the different uh, public art and that type of stuff too. Your mention of uh, the cold shoots reminded me of a different kind of walk which we take in the rising house, which is walking the halls for exercise. And some of the, uh, some of the older wigs have, uh, the remain, have uh, still uh, remnants of a box, which apparently was outside every, was at every apartment door that you'd open and maybe put in newspapers or uh, milk deliveries. I'm That's not so sure. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've been amazed. I took myself on, I mean, just between here and the bathroom, but you have so much wonderful art here. And I'm like, I guess I should be, you know, checking in at the desk every day and just doing a little walk around here because there's so much to see. It's like amazing. Yes. Thanks, one over here. In your walks, how did you decide what you were going to count? Ducklings as opposed to espresso bars, or gay pride flags, or Thai restaurants, <laughs> or anything else you might come across? So what I typically do when I set out on a walk is, um, if I notice something, I'll say, hmm, that's interesting, there was a Q-tip on the sidewalk. And then if I walk another couple blocks and I see another Q-tip, I'm like, okay, this is going in the notebook. So then I'll start a little count of Q-tips. But then maybe in the meantime, I've started to see cats on porches or something like that. I'll start my little cat on porch tally. And then as time goes on, I either lose interest in the things that I was originally tallying or there haven't been many more of them. Sometimes two is enough. 
two Q-tips, that's pretty exciting, you know? Um, <laughs> um, so I'm basically just trying to capture as much as I can so that by the end of it, I can kind of figure out is, is the cat count more impressive or more interesting in some sort of way than the Q-tip count, you know? So having to make all these decisions about that. But for the most part, I'm just kind of, I'll see something, I'll put it in the notebook, and then there's more of it, that tally will start. Um, but certainly there are a lot of tallies that don't go anywhere or where I don't see enough or I see too much or, you know. <laughs> Over here, yeah. Yeah, but it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, my wife, Pam, is, has been away, is, is away, and those two books are fascinating. Is there somewhere that I can actually buy those? Uh, not those two, but some place that I can buy them? Yes, well, I'll be selling them right now. <laughs> <laughs> After this, I'd be happy to sign them. But they're also available at Elliott Bay, Third Place Books. Pretty much all the local bookstores have them. And thank you, I'm so glad to hear that. It's nice, one of the things I've gotten, you know, from people who have lived in Seattle for a year, people who have lived in Seattle for 70 years, people who are first graders, people who are far beyond first grade. It seems like everybody finds something that connects, about my books that connects with them. And I like that I've been able to kind of, not bridge that gap, but kind of appeal to newcomers and old timers alike um, and it's really cool and especially cool when kids um, I've gotten a few kids who have made their own walk reports and that sort of thing so that's been really fun to see too okay, one more. oh sorry um, I'm... <laughs> no? yeah um, I've noticed and this is a newer thing and it started about, oh, five years ago, or maybe even ten, in the Columbia City area, seeing, um, they're like mobiles, that are hanging in just unexpected places, off of a wire, or, you know, and now I'm seeing them elsewhere around town, and do you know any, what, any, thing about the artist who might be doing it? Are they painted wood and sometimes yes. have like CDs yes. just for they eyes have, and that sort of yeah. thing? Yeah, well, there are yeah. a variety of things, yes. Yeah, um, I know that the um, creator of those has an Instagram account where they post the art that they make and it's called something like Seattle Sea Dragons. Um, but I don't know the artist's name and I don't know much more about them beyond that. Um, but it is always kind of fun to see those little flourishes that people decide to put out there into the world, especially when they're, you know, the cool little mobiles like that. There's some different, a lot of different, really interesting ones out there. I don't know if anyone's seen them, but there's a lot of them on, tends to be a lot of them around Capitol Hill and Broadway, too. Oh, one more? <laughs> Two things. Yes. Uh, one was uh, Can't hear you. our former house. Uh, Sue, so can you use a microphone? Our former house had a coal chute in it where it would begin and always wondered uh, what to do about it. <laughs> we put in wood, finally just uh, put it, kept it there. The other thing is that the Actual, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Where you, Can you use the, the microphone? Where you have the, uh, um, not, not coal shoots, but the, the type of uh, thing uh, on the street where you have a big round circle. Oh, yeah. Uh, the person who brought those in was Paul Shell, who was the mayor at the time. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. So he was the one who wanted to put in the those those uh, things on all the streets. Thank you, Paul. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Well, I wanted to say, and not to take away from this, anybody who wants to buy a book of their very own, that the Horizon House Library also has both books. 
And um, you know, you can you can borrow one, but bring it back <laughs> so that others can have a chance at it. So um, um, it's been so wonderful to have Susanna here, and um, maybe we can convince her to come back again sometime with new research. Yeah, thank you.